forever by what we've just gone through with the pandemic. Hand it to you, love. Well, thanks, Deborah, and uh, great to see uh, Eric and, and Michael this morning. Good to see um, so many of you uh, already participating in the pre-show. It's going to be an amazing ASU GSV summit coming up. Um, Deborah, I, I'm very much of the view, uh, I, I believe it's the general view at ASU, that uh, we're going to be uh, with this bug, Corona, uh, COVID-19, uh, not only for a very long time, effectively from a st strategic uh, position, probably forever, uh, we'll be managing it forever. Uh, the digital transformation uh, enabled by uh, COVID-19 has accelerated uh, all over uh, our industry. And we think at ASU in particular, because we've been very intentional, uh, you know, we very much uh, uh, believe that we're in a strong position to come out even stronger uh, in terms of our innovation activities, in terms of our commitment to our charter, uh, coming out of uh, you know the current chapter if you will and so back in in, in when we last chatted I, I shared that we had about a half a million uh, zoom sessions already uh, just checking um, our data just before the show uh, we're at uh, 1.3 million uh, uh, zoom meetings at ASU in terms of the total minutes it's kind of hard to believe this but there's been 26 billion with a oh, B. Yeah minutes of Zoom sessions. If, if you string that out, that's over 3,000 years uh, of Zoom sessions uh, across ASUs, as you said, 125,000 learners, uh, just in, in our higher education uh, sector uh, going forward. And, and obviously, from, from our perspective, you know, Zoom is such an important foundational commitment to our innovation agenda. Uh, we build innovation on top of, of Zoom. Uh, routinely and regularly. Uh, and we also engage in a, a wide range of other, I would say, very innovative activities. I think that, you know, hats off to all of our faculty. There are 5,600 faculty at ASU. The pivot that they needed to do, the investment of my team and, and others across the university to help those faculty uh, in that transition to not only go to Zoom, but to completely reconceptualize the pedagogy of delivery in this uh, online, but very much live remote uh, mode is actually a work in progress across the land around the world right now. And we're very excited about um, the tools that our faculty are using and, and new ones that are coming forward. And, and I would just say that, you know, on top of all the things that I've shared already in terms of our innovation agenda, ASU is very much already thinking about what comes next. Uh, we announced a very important, I think, a commitment to uh, XR, VR learning through a partnership with Dreamscape uh, in the last 10 days, which I think is all about discovery and exploration and actually scaling massively across the globe. We're also being invested in, in distributed le uh, ledger technologies, blockchain and the like to, to really allow students to have a transcript that has more than just the grade point average in the major and ability to really be able to tag all the learning experiences that go on uh, in the learning environment, and I could say a lot more. That is why ASU, I think, has uh, an earned reputation for, for being so committed to and expressing uh, innovation uh, across the institution. And suffice it to say, ASU is completely convicted that online learning, synchronous or asynchronous, can be equally efficacious and even potentially more engaging than offline experiences. A absolutely. And again, at ASU uh, online, uh, delivered by our colleagues at Ed Plus at ASU. All of our faculty are ASU faculty. All of the design work is done by the ASU uh, faculty community. So in terms of the quality of the actual instruction uh, combined with an, an outstanding instructional design team, we are absolutely of the, of the conviction uh, that uh, this is as good as, and as we have found out since March 16th, there are many scenarios, many use cases where actually this online live remote is actually more of an educational opportunity for learners and for professors uh, than, they, than, than they had had previously. And just one last data point, uh, if you don't mind, Deborah, you know, we met everything at, at ASU. I mean, that's one of our obsessions that uh, starts with Michael Crow and it, it, it goes right down through the entire organization. We measure everything. And we were very concerned as there was kind of a, 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 a meme out there that somehow, you know, what was happening in March uh, was kind of somehow a discount, somehow less than valuable to our mm -hmm. learners. <laughs> we, had, we had higher uh, 
customer satisfaction measured by our student satisfaction than ever, ever that we've measured and persistence to completion of the semester was higher than ever. So again, two key data points on the efficacy of this modality being, uh, I think, uh, drawn out by really uh, the experience of, of 125,000 students. That's spectacular. Um, Eric, let me switch to you. I, it, you know, we'll, I'll start by saying it, sounds, it feels like you, you, you all found the right partners um, to, to embark on the, the transformation of education. But basically in March, Zoom lifted the 40 minute limit of the paywall effectively for more than 100,000 K-12 schools in, in 25 countries, making Zoom free to schools. Um, stepping back for more context in terms of user growth, in December of 2019, Zoom had a peak of 10 million daily meeting participants. That peak grew to 300 million in April, and you can update us on where it is today. Um, but, but needless to say, that is absolutely stunning growth, um, bringing entirely two, uh, new meaning to the word Zoom. Uh, your passion, and I you know, follow, followed, and fo followed you on YouTube in many, many different formats, your passion um, has always been all about the product and the happiness of your customers. I'd love to hear your view on how Zoom is thinking today about the pre-K to gray synchronous digital education and how you know, your vision for Zoom's ability to transform learning around the world. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. First of all, thank you so much for your invitation. And I was so inspired by Lev's talk about the, the ASU initiatives. I think I, I'm so inspired. I also probably want to become a student of ASU if I could start <laughs> my learning again. So yeah, that's a great question, Deborah. So, the way I look at it is, you look at it, uh, everyone in the world, let's say if all of us from pre-K to grade, all of us can figure out a way to learn anywhere and think about what we can do, all of us in the world, every day think about what we can do to become a better world of ourselves through learning. That's a much better world, right? You look at the traditional, Educational delivery used to be just live, right? And uh, students or, or, or teachers, they got to physically be together. And sometimes also need to carry my textbook as well, right? I think that's a tradition for many, many years. I think that in the future, I think uh, given the, the digital transformation and the online teaching, online classes, I think that the world where I can live will be anyone, anywhere they can learn. So that's why, you know, we decided to offer the free service to K-12 schools and also a lot of continuing study group and also can help adults as well. Essentially, you know, with the technology and the, the platform like Zoom and others, together we can offer a platform to allow anyone in the world, anytime they can learn, they can become a better one of themselves. I think that's a future of education. That's wonderful. Okay, the um, Michael, let me address you. You actually, you're you know sort of special seat over the last nine months because the vantage point of the parent of uh, three younger children um, in K twelve public schools, younger than mine. I'll say mine are all adults. They're younger than mine. Um, and as the founder and longtime CEO of, of what was really the first truly scaled global education technology company, Blackboard. So just love your reflection on how your front row seat really spurred you to found, found Class EDU, which you formally announced publicly yesterday. And full disclosure, GSB is an investor. Um, love to hear what opportunities you saw this go around and that caused you to jump back into the ed tech ring and your vision for really improving synchronous digital learning at scale. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Deborah, thank you so much for allowing me to be here on this great panel. Very excited to uh, be next to Lev and Eric talking about something I'm so passionate about. Uh, but yes, I, I was home during the very beginning of the coronavirus. And as soon as my, my children, I have a, a daughter who was in second grade at the time, a, a young son who was in eighth grade, and my older daughter who was uh, just finishing up her sophomore year, all in three different public schools suddenly found themselves at home having to engage with their teachers and their class fully online. And one of the big problems and challenges that we had was that typically my children would be in a, a take a class for three to four hours a week for each of their classes and be in school maybe 30 to 40 hours a week. 
And yet a lot of their teachers instead had just started giving them assignments to do at home and then having maybe an hour of office hours at the end of the week where they would talk and help them out with their homework. So the kids were pretty much on their own for the entire week. And I felt in many ways they were being left behind because they weren't getting the focus and the education that they really were getting when they were previously in school full time. And we talked with a lot of the teachers and we said, why are you reducing your class time down from three to four hours down to only one hour? And the results uh, and the feedback we got from a lot of them was that uh, Zoom was great. And the other online tools that they were using to be able to connect online were a, a, a lifeline for them to stay connected to the students. However, they just didn't typically lecture for three to four hours a week in class. There's a lot of other things that they were doing. So allowing the, the, the students to work in groups, uh, even uh, handing out assignments or doing tests or quizzes live in class, uh, or even taking attendance or grading items, all things that they do within the class time that they weren't able to yet translate to an online environment. And uh, even now, and now that we're in this new semester, this, my kids are all still engaging in school at home. And the teachers were all told them, you have to hold three to four hours of class time a week. And a lot of them were saying, I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna fill up all that time. So I knew that even though these online platforms such as Zoom were allowing school to happen at home, <clears throat> there needed to be more that was done. And, and that's why we created a class for Zoom. We, we, we knew Zoom had a great API and SDK that it was an incredible platform that could be built on top of. So I, I took my expertise in e-learning and got together with other developers that I had worked with previously at Blackboard. And we took and built on top of the powerful Zoom audio and video capabilities, adding in things that teachers could use to engage even more deeply with the students, like the ability to hand out an assessment or a test or a quiz in class, the ability to hand out an assignment, the ability to talk one-on-one -on -one with the student without leaving the, the Zoom environment, uh, the ability to, to take attendance, the ability to proctor exams. And what we found is that through our early conversation with teachers, this is really giving them that full set of tools they need to bring their physical classroom online. And, and we think that combined with Zoom, this is gonna be an even more powerful solution going forward as more and more classes are really starting to find their own way in offering an online version. Fantastic. Maybe, maybe we have um, uh, Michael and Lev talk about this and Eric, if you have, a, have you as well. I think one of the things is we all have watched um, this, this move to remote learning. And, and I sort of get a chuckle on the term remote learning. It's really home learning, which is not remote at all. Um, and every student in the world should be able to have a, a highly efficacious experience learning at home. Um, but one of the things that became clear in both the K-12 and higher ed segment was that um, teachers and faculties for the most part, and that would be you know, notable exceptions like ASU, had been given you know, sort of little professional development to really prepare them for the move. And they were really thrown in, you know, inadequate supports, et cetera. Um, and teaching you know, online is very different than teaching live in a classroom as, as um, you know, both of you guys well know. I, I guess my question is, you know, has the last seven months, and I've been reading some polls and things, really fixed this? And it may be different in higher ed level than it is in K-12. But you know, I'd love to hear from you all. What what further work needs to be done, and what can we you know how can we do a better job of supporting educators generally? Love, you want to start? Sure, sure. So uh, I'm going to take a, an opportunity to also respond to Jim Hardaway's question in the Q and A. That's exactly along the same lines, uh, Deborah. And um, I, I do think you know from ASU's perspective, obviously you know we've ha had you know an on the ground program that's very very uh, large in scope. We, you know, we were early um, in the online asynchronous uh, delivery uh, through ASU online. And uh, again, that's uh, been spectacular growth, 23% growth this year, this fall semester over last. So huge growth there. And at ASU, you know, we've got this third modality that you just finished describing, Deborah. We call it ASU Sync, uh, which is this live, uh, live remote. Um, and the truth is uh, nobody actually knows exactly what that playbook looks like. We don't know how to do it from an instructional design perspective. Faculty, you know, definitely, um, you know, creative juices uh, were flowing, but there was also, I think, fair to say across the board, there was certainly trepidation uh, that this new modality, uh, really beyond the idea that we would turn a camera on and we would start talking, uh, we really didn't have an instructional framework. And, and at ASU, again, we've got, a, you know, we have a digital backpack full of tools and we have an instructional design team that it has been very adaptive taking everything that we've learned from ASU online in the asynchronous mode and working, not because we had a cookbook that was tried and true in the sense of what would happen with remote live, 
but we knew that these were tools that could be used and we hoped adapted to uh, the environment. And so of course uh, there's, uh, there's Zoom and there's our learning management system and there's uh, Adobe Creative Cloud and Dropbox and all of these tools were then provided to uh, the instructional design community. I see this as a, especially for the uh, ASU and GSV Summit crowd, again, I'm not sure it'd be very interesting to ever to sort of see who's participating this year as opposed to the last 10 years. Um, but you know, in general, this is a huge opportunity uh, for innovation and entrepreneurship because we really are, uh, we are in a uh, new environment where at least to my vantage point, we're gonna have this third mode forever. And just like the initial online experience allowed us to have a proliferation of very, very important tools to support students' success, which is the goal. Now is the moment again, I think, for entrepreneurs uh, and for those who invest in entrepreneurs to take a look at the opportunity to support the full instructional experience, the pedagogy, the delivery. That's uh, the kind of thing that Michael Chazen just finished talking about in terms of the way you know he saw the problem set. I think this is now broadly uh, open for uh, the entrepreneurial community. And I think, again, this is not something that will go away uh, whenever the vaccine shows up. This is a mode that the market is speaking to loud and clear. The market of students and their families actually in, in the higher education and at least at ASU, this is something that they're actually very interested in and it supports you know, the transformation of the economy that is underway. It supports the disruption that is underway and it allows for more balance uh, in the complexities associated with the disease, the economy and many other issues. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll head it to you. Two seconds. Quick ad responding to Lev. So I will tell you it's a little different this year. Right As of right now, we have we have people on from Ukraine, India, South Africa, Morocco, Kazakhstan, Peru, Colombia, Scotland, Bahamas, Israel, and Sudan. So I'm not sure we've ever had all those, those uh, countries represented live in San Diego. So I am thrilled that we are able to be virtual and show that kind of geographical diversity. Extraordinary. But yes, Michael, talk to it and can, can, can Lev take that kind of an innovation? Can you port that kind of innovation into the K-12 market to, to service all those you know, fantastic teachers there? You, you know, building upon what Lev said, when you said, hey, look, are, are we there yet? You know, or, or what's been going on for these last several months? We are only at the very tipping point of, I believe, what the, the net effect of this is going to be. You can't suddenly train hundreds of thousands of teachers and now millions of students in online learning and not expect to have this long-term effect. I think what this has done is it's really sped up the entire industry by, e by easily five to 10 years. And what this means is that even once Secure is available, I think we are never going back. There are gonna be more online programs, more parts of programs are gonna be online. There's gonna be, as Eric actually said, a much greater uh, dispersion of people being able to actually have access to education because of lowering costs of education. Now that you've suddenly trained all of these teachers in online learning, you can bet that there are gonna be more programs and more affordable programs going forward in the future. And I think that's gonna revolutionize not only education here in the US, but education around the world. That's true. Eric, I'd love to, um, let me, one, if you're delighted to have you comment on that, because obviously you, you all had a fantastic education dedicated event this summer that um, was put together, I think, quite quickly to try to be responsive to the, to the, to the, educate, the K-12 educators in particular. And I think you've got over 40,000 um, people show, you know, educators show up for that event. So I know you all are working hard to support it. Um, yeah, do you want to comment on that? And then I have another question for you. Sure, sure. First of all, I, I, I totally agree with what the left side. That's a huge opportunity for the entrepreneurial community to invest to this online teaching, online uh, learning and uh, industry. Because you are so right, Deborah, online learning experience is very different compared to the traditional learning. So prior to pandemic crisis, we had so many universities who are already using Zoom and we also have a webinar to train those affected members. However, when the pandemic crisis hit us, after we decided to offer the free services, I think we made a mistake. We saw that those K-12 school teachers, they know how to use the tools like Zoom. That's not right. That's why we you know we corrected the mistake. And not only did we offer the weekly webinar, but also in the summertime, we offer the summer academy. It's very important we got to realize that we got to train and uh, those educators to make sure they know those uh, modern tools. That's the one. Two, we also need to give them flexibility. And like what Michael does, right? This is great. 
you know, give all the, the, the faculty members, the teachers from K-12 school to the high ed, you know, some of the, uh, you know, for like flexible tools, right? That's very important too. Last but not least, we got to be proactive to listen to those educators because this innovation should be driven from both sides, right? On the one hand, the entrepreneurial community, they want to build something cool to help. On the other hand, we need to sit down, listen to those educators carefully, always solicit the feedback. Together, it's a great community to improve the online teaching experience. Exactly. Eric, I'd like to step back a little bit. When you immigrated from China in 1997, which, which is something you did with great determination, and, um, and I'd love you to talk a little bit about how your determination to, to do that has sort of, in, in the immigration period, has, has um, informed the way you, you live and, and work. But you joined WebEx, um, and I, I, I'm sure you could never have imagined that you would actually create a company that ha is both an adjective and a noun. That's pretty cool. I don't think, you, yeah, I guess Google is both that, but it's quite amazing. Um, I would love, what is it about that has made Zoom so much better and so much more popular than, than other alternatives? And, you know, you know, I love the part about your culture, your focus on culture. And I'm just curious as you have managed through this super hyper growth, which is probably, I don't know if there's any precedent for the kind of growth that you've been living through over the last nine months as CEO of a public company. But can you talk about the company culture? You have a, a very out there and overt focus on happiness and love, and you're not afraid to use those words very aggressively in the corporate setting. And I'm just curious um, if that has helped as you as you manage through this, I mean, how this has helped and, and how you all have been able to maintain that culture in the face of this kind of um, whirlwind. Yeah, so yes, first of all, I, I want to say the company match the culture really matters. That's probably the number one thing for you to build a startup company. If you want to further grow, the, grow your business to be successful, you've got to lead the folks on company culture. So when I started a Zoom in 2011, so in the practice that I, I came, I, to Silicon Valley in 1997 to pursue my American dream and join WebEx as one of the first several founding engineers. And after 14 years of hard work, and I decided to leave. The reason why I left, the year before I left, every time when I talked with a WebEx customer, I can tell you the truth, I did not see a single happy customer. So every morning when I woke up, I was not happy. That's why when I started Zoom, the number one thing I asked myself, what kind of a company I want to work for in the next 10 or 20 years? I want to make sure I'm happy, all Zoom employees happy. If we can make our, if I can make our employee happy, guess what? Together, we can make our customers happy. So that's a very simple the formula. Not to mention along the way, I realized the purpose of life is to pursue sustainable happiness. And the sustainable happiness comes from making others happy, making your customers happy. So that's the reason why our company culture is to deliver happiness. So over the past you know, several months, let, let's say we were facing all kinds of challenges. However, we still focused on our company culture. Nobody complained. We worked so hard to leverage this opportunity to do all we can to really care about customers. That's the reason why we survived. If our employee happy, if I'm happy, guess what? The productivity wise, this is great. No matter what kind of channel you are facing, our employees, we always can figure out a solution because the goal is simple. We want to make sure our customer happy. So that's the reason why, you know, we really focus on our company culture and we keep talking about that. I think that's the only thing I feel like we should double down, triple down. I personally feel proud. Fantastic. A great, a great lesson for everyone on this call. Um, let's step back and, and, and bring up one of the more, you know, I, I think serious or perhaps more um, uh, troubling outcomes of the pandemic as it relates to online learning. It's, and it's, and it's, I, just, I would just love your, your views if there's a silver lining here in that um, it certainly laid bare the whole issue of the digital divide in our, not only in our country, in the US, but, but around the world. 
Um, we've certainly seen millions of students who, you know, lack the bandwidth or the device to really easily access um, remote learning or home learning and all the stories of, of folks having to park in parking lots to, to pick up um, to pick up bandwidth, et cetera. And I'm just curious, as you think about it and you think about um, you know, maybe a little bit of politics and, uh, and things like that, or, or is perhaps one of the silver linings coming out of COVID that we're going to develop the political and sort of societal will to address sort of the the right of every student, every citizen to to have um, to be able to to have you know bandwidth and access and device access to learn at home. And um, I'm just curious if you feel like we can make if, amongst all the optimism about digital learning that that is a pretty big obstacle if we can't solve it. So I'm just I'm curious what you think um, there. Maybe Lev will let you let you start. Uh, Deborah, I mean, I'd say um, for the last 25 years, uh, I and a, and a small band of lone wolves have been sort of uh, out there uh, uh, talking and yelling to anyone who will listen about the importance of digital equity. And I, my very first uh, statement to you uh, at the top of the show was that uh, COVID has uh, helped us to digitally accelerate uh, uh, a whole range of very important things. Projects at the university that would have taken, uh, you know, five or six years are now being done in five or six months. Uh, the issue associated with uh, access uh, and, and adoption and digital equity are, are non-trivial. Uh, there's a hundred. There's lots of reasons. It's a big dollar amount. And it, there's all kinds of dysfunctionality in the delivery. But my, from my view, if not now, when? And there is broad consensus not unanimity, because there's plenty of people and organizations that sort of see, uh, you know, a change in the environment as, uh, you know, something that they might end up losing uh, some market share or things of that sort. So it's not like there is unanimity uh, out there, but there is broad consensus among carriers, among device uh, providers. And at ASU, we've been having executive level uh, conversations with both the carriers, um, both the traditional wireline as well as, as wireless as well as most, as you just mentioned, hugely important to get devices in people's uh, and especially families' uh, hands. Uh, and then it, as it turns out, why is ASU in that conversation? Not only because we have lots and lots of students who live remotely uh, in reservations or, uh, in, uh, in rural Arizona and so forth, but also because we believe we are a great partner for content delivery. I mean, it's hugely important that it not just be seen as let's get technology out there. If you don't combine it with well-designed instructional materials and professional development for teachers. Again, where we partnered with Eric um, and the Zoom team that was working on the Summer Academy for teachers, because it's hugely important. No one has ever, no one has 10 years of this experience. So we're all inventing this together. And then, you know, non-trivially for all of us who work in university settings, this is also a huge organizational change dimension here. Organizations are going to get upset and, and folks are going to see their cheese being moved, uh, you know, to, to invoke the, an, an old ad, uh, you know, sort of a picture here. Uh, and all of that together, it is the end-to-end -end view, access, devices, content, professional development, change management. That's a, that's a huge opportunity. Uh, and again, I would say to the you know, ASU GSV community, great entrepreneurial uh, uh, opportunity to bring a thread through all of that. And ASU, of course, uh, we feel like we're right in the middle of it. But the, the net effect of everything that Lev is talking about is really going to be the lowering of the cost of education and making it more widely available. You know, I remember uh, when I was running Blackboard, I actually had the opportunity to go visit some of the schools that were using our technology in China. And they were telling us that they were using it because they were able to reach students that were three to five hours outside the city that couldn't come in every day. And they were actually accessing Blackboard on their mobile phones and they were able to offer education to people they otherwise couldn't reach. Well, I think what's happening with Zoom today is doing that on an entirely now uh, much bigger level. And I think that once uh, you have suddenly trained all of these teachers and you've implemented the programs that Lev has just talked about in ways to improve content delivery and you've addressed the issue from uh, making sure everyone has the correct devices, you really can get education in the hands of so many more people and help elevate an entire society. Uh, and that's what's exciting about what's going on now. Now, that being said, I think right now we're, we're a little bit underwater though. I mean, I'm worried now that we actually have a generation of kids and my own kids included that are almost getting left behind. That if we don't figure out how to maximize what we're doing with Zoom and how to really not just teach online, but really in, make sure that we have teachers that are engaging with their students online, 
that while we're going through this change, there are some kids that can be negatively affected. So even though I'm very positive for what this means in the long haul, I think that the important thing is that we need to be focused on what we're doing today to ensure that we're just not leaving a generation of children behind as we go through this, this rough patch with COVID. Oh, no, no question. There's going to be tremendous learning loss, particularly for socioeconomically vulnerable students. And, and I think the only thing to address it is, is remote learning. Eric, do you have thoughts there? I know you all have some philanthropic efforts in that regard too. Yeah, so Deborah, if you ask about the, the term of a digital divider three years ago, I would say I even do not understand what that means because I, I really took that for granted before, only until two years ago. And with the, the you know, we, you know, our company headquarters in San Jose, the mayor of San Jose, Sam you know, Ricardo, and he kicked off a key initiative, right, to work together with a local high tech community and to address the digital divide. Then I realized, wow, that's, that's something actually that's bigger than I thought. You know, as a medical mission, no one should lag behind. However, today is, you know, we, you know, I'm so you know, lucky to live in Silicon Valley. Guess what? A lot of uh, the areas where we still have a lot of families where they may not afford for the, 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 the internet, you know, connectivity or the, the computer. So having said that, this is not a huge opportunity for the entrepreneurial community. Like what, we can, what we can do together to help every family, every student, make sure no one should lag behind. That's really important. Deborah, can I just quick uh, postscript, you know, 30% of America is either unconnected or underconnected. It's 10 million K-12 school age children who have no connectivity. This is to underscore Michael Chazen's point and, and Eric's point as well. Uh, it's hugely important that it's not just a divide that's at risk. It's the prospects of the gap getting bigger. Correct. And again, as you said it, Deborah, this is like a generation lost. Um, and of course, it's not just education. It's how will they get healthcare delivery? How will they get financial support for sort of financial literacy when all of this is so rapidly moving to an online environment? So again, as an educator, and I think as ASU, as an institution whose charter is all around access, we take this very seriously and we look to the entrepreneurial and to the venture community for actually doing the right thing. And we also think in doing the right thing, there's also plenty of opportunity to create the margins that continue the success of the entrepreneur. Well, I, that's a perfect feed into a question I have for Michael. I, I think there is a big difference in the ed tech community of today. And obviously the ACGSB Summit is very much focused around education innovation than, there, than it was when Michael started um, uh, Blackboard back in 1997, correct? Yeah. Um, you know, so arguably, actually, it's really literally when when Eric was uh, was starting WebEx, which was really also viewed to be in the ed tech category at least a bit, right? When it when it started, and um, you know, our, you know, without question, Blackboard was the most successful ed tech company of version 1.0 of ed tech. Um, it must be, you know, you, you took the company public, you sold it to a private ec private equity, um, and and now you're back. Which it must be a, a what it must be a little bit of a shock because suddenly ed tech, which was not at the when you built that very successful business, was not viewed to be, um, you know, kind of the the hot the the sort of the hot area for for innovation and and investment and and great new ideas and impact. So I, you know, I'd love to kind of get your, your views on, you know, how, how, are you, how are you porting things you learn at Blackboard into your class EDU idea? How does it, how does it help you think about, you know, making impact faster? Um, you know, and, and, and what, what might be pitfalls, I think, um, uh, as you, you know, you're very early on embarking on your journey. You know, the, the, the big difference I would say between um, then and now is, Back when we started Blackboard, we were going to schools for the first time saying, hey, let me explain. We really think that this whole internet thing is gonna cause you to put some of your class materials online, maybe even put tests and quizzes online until you're eventually having an entire class or whole program online. And a lot of schools came back to us and said, oh, I'm not sure that's really gonna happen. Sometimes, uh, you know, some of our, our, our teachers aren't ready for that type of technology. The students aren't asking for it. And maybe it's illegal to put grades online. And that, we actually heard this from several different institutions. And then very slowly, they started adopting this technology first just by to use it to complement their existing classes and then maybe even just put a course. And then suddenly the entire program started showing up online. But it was very, very slow. And we were going into the schools, not just showcasing our software, but really pitching them and talking with them about the benefits of online learning. Well, 
Now I can tell you that there are no discussions with schools about, hey, you should really put your education online. I mean, just the opposite. Suddenly every single teacher at the school is doing online learning and has had a crash course in it. And so now the schools are figuring out, okay, both what can we do to make sure that the teachers have the tools they need to be successful? And then what are other new methodologies that we can pull in? I mean, Lev gave an example of a, a list of a whole bunch of technologies that are now used in uh, online learning that the schools are using or figuring out that are part of their overall process. So uh, I think that the, the big difference is uh, institutions now not only are comfortable using this technology, they know that they need to be utilizing it to address not only this challenge that's here today, but for, for where we're going in the future. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that, you know, Lev, you had talked a lot about just the different entrepreneurs that are out there now. Back when Matthew Patinsky and I started Blackboard, there was really only even a handful of ed tech companies out there. And I'm talking like across the whole uh, United States. Now, uh, there are several multi-billion dollar, very successful ed tech companies. You have Zoom, I think, is now the most successful education tech company uh, overall when you consider the number of people that are teaching and, and, and learning on it. I'm actually thankful that Zoom has this open API and SDK because even though they, of course, are building education features onto Zoom themselves, this allows other entrepreneurs like myself to really extend the product in ways that they're not yet thinking of or doing, and especially because there's lots of different types of uh, e-learning out there. So the fact that it's much more open community now and the fact that every institution is now looking at online learning as core to what they're doing, it's just so fundamentally different from when we started Blackboard, uh, gosh, over over 20 years now. Long time ago, you, you haven't aged much. No, no, <laughs> thank you. But the, the thing that's just more exciting is so when you take a look at, I mean, I think it was a slow growth over the last 20 years. And I think over the last seven months, we've maybe accelerated another 10. So uh, really what's gonna happen in the next just year or two, I think is gonna be mind boggling for the for the ed tech space and for education overall. And Lev, I'll, I'll extend that question for you. Humorously, you know, we partnered with Arizona State 12 years ago to start the ASU GSB Summit. And what, what perhaps the best thing that's ever happened to GSB was partnering with ASU. And um, humorously, when, when we partnered, ASU had four technology partners, four. Um, today, 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 and that was tw only 12 years ago. It's amazing. Today, I don't know, you probably have 4,000, but um, probably not. You probably don't want 4,000. But if you, Lev, have also lived through the, the, the version one to version three um, as a buyer and as someone really directing the, you know, the future of ed tech from the, from the other side of the table, from what, what Michael did at Blackboard, what, what are your thoughts on the way it's evolved, um, you know, over this, over this period and, and the, you know, the, the four, when, when ASU had, uh, predated you when, when they only had four, four tech partners, but. Yeah, so I'll, I'll share that, uh, you know, in the decade or so, you know, ASU has been intentional in its design to reach out to young entrepreneurs um, in the ed tech space, as well as uh, sort of a relative uh, sort of up, upstarts uh, in this space uh, who've got startup activity. Um, and we've, you know, successfully incorporated, especially in our online environment, uh, over 250 different technology companies. Uh, into uh, into our ecosystem of instructional support. Um, uh, some of them are sort of specifically product and customer facing. Um, many of them are essentially glue uh, that can sort of uh, pull things together across the menu of things uh, that instructional designers and faculty uh, use in the delivery. I, I, I would underscore just the point that Michael made, which is so much opportunity is uh, here right now, not only for easy things, but also for hard things that we need to to really be paying attention to, uh, try, trying to sort through, you know, access uh, that's more than just being compliant with 504 and 508. What can we really do? I love that Eric just announced uh, recently that you can now pin two videos where we can actually have an American Sign Language uh, tutor right beside her or his student so that they can take advantage of Zoom. That, that, that for, that, those are the kind of entrepreneurial uh, opportunities that I, I see sort of for this moment in time, uh, being able to really uh, fill out some of the equity and con uh, access concerns that, that we've all had. And I do think that we're at a very different moment of time. This is, this is very much, how do we do the right thing across the values that matter to each of our organizations and institutions and partner in ways that were almost unimaginably, unimaginable, even to Michael Crow, whose vision is, is, is the, most, the, the most sort of far, flung and, and most uh, amazing, you know, hard for him to have seen 10 years ago, but he can see it now. That's why we're doing 
uh, so many partnerships and taking, I would say, calculated risks that even he probably wouldn't have been willing to make 10 years ago, although he, because of him, we have ASU online. And because of that, I think we have a very rich um, offering across the nation in terms of online instruction. Excellent. Well, I think we're down to our last few, few you know, literal minutes. I, and I'll actually tie it through. I think one, one of the questions we have in the Q&A, which I think feeds into Eric's, um, Eric's all of your approaches. Like one of the big changes is that we have moved to a very learner-centered model for innovation, right? I think there could, it could be argued in version 1.0 that it was more top-down. And I, you know, and I'm curious, I'll, I'll let, I'll let, let Eric have the last the last comment. I'm curious if, if you all agree that we've gotten to a place where it, this is really about the, the happiness of the customer, uh, which is the learner at the end of the day. I, I think this is the beginning of this new era, you know, and as Leo mentioned, EdTech has a huge opportunity and uh, the, in terms of digital transformation, digital uh, learning experience, and a lot of technology, a lot of entrepreneurs, and uh, all the learners, and uh, you know, online, you know, educators, and together, I think that we can create this opportunity. And still with that, I think again, this is something you know, beginning. We are very excited about the huge opportunity in the future. Well, thank you all. I am so grateful for the three of you for uh, appearing in our, our inaugural stage at the ASU GSV Virtual. Um, really, really appreciate it. Amazing conversation. Um, and now with that, I am thrilled to introduce our next speaker, who is Phil Libin, who is the co-founder and CEO of Evernote, and now the founder and CEO of Umhum, which he will explain to you, I'm sure, in a very entertaining presentation. So with that, Phil can take it away. Thank you.